All right, here's a slightly different lecture for you, um, hopefully one that you'll find extremely useful, which is sort of the theme of this lecture, I guess. I get to use these lectures now to do uh, a number of different things with you. And in this case, my idea is to show you um, a sort of another class of, uh, let me say, I don't know, psychology knowledgeable person that if you, you know, say do a degree in psychology and you understand your, your psychology really well, there's always that question of, you know, what can you do with that knowledge? And the textbook has talked a lot about research opportunities, applied research, basic research, so you could become a researcher yourself, but you could also become someone who um, brings psychology to other contexts. Uh, so a, a different form of applying psychology, not applied research, so you're not necessarily doing research somewhere, but with an understanding of psychology, you can maybe bring that to some other issue where it has value. Uh, and in this case, for example, we just talked about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. I described to you how the sympathetic nervous system kind of wakes up and, and you know, rises to a challenge, but then it's really intended to rise to these short-term acute challenges, right? The predator stepping out of the bush, the child who got trapped under the car. You get that strength, you deal with it, and then it's over. Um, it's not meant to deal with chronic. Uh, anxiety or chronic stress. Uh, and so, you know, if you understand that anxiety response of the body, is there anything you can tell people who could be suffering chronic stress? So for example, you know, with anxiety uh, around COVID now, it's, it's higher than it's ever been. There's more people who now understand, you know, what it means to, to be feeling very anxious or even in some cases depressed. We're going to focus on anxiety here, but based on what you learned, what advice might you give somebody? And in a sense, what the rest of this lecture is going to be is me giving you guys advice, um, yeah, in, in this sort of spirit to show how you can apply psychology. Now, I'm going to bring out my friend Yoda here um, all the way through uh, because I kind of like to think about it this way, that um, I think this is a really interesting time for people to learn some mental health skills, um, some, some strategies and, and tips that they can use to kind of keep themselves from getting too anxious in this case. Uh, and, and so let's kind of walk through it. Now that you understand the sympathetic nervous system, most of this should make a lot of sense to you. So uh, I always like to argue that if you want to become good at managing your own anxiety, uh, I bring up Yoda because I kind of think of that like a Jedi mind trick, right? So the Jedi warriors could lift things with their mind. They could influence other people to believe what they said. But you would like to think they also had a very good control over their own mental state and their own body. Uh, and that's what I'm sort of focusing on here. What if Yoda, what if you were a Jedi and Yoda were to give you some advice about how to gain control of your own body and mind around anxiety? That's the sort of spirit. And so the first thing thou do thou must is recognize it. I don't know. I won't, I won't do Yoda to you guys all the way through. Uh, but, but I will say, you know, in order to do this, you, there's two critical steps. And while the second step often will be the focus of many, it's useless without this first step. And this first step is really recognizing when your anxiety response is, is keying up and taking control of you. Remember that anxiety response is associated with the limbic system, which is the most primitive part of us, the most primitive part of our brain, and the part that's most closely linked to emotion. So when our anxieties arise, we become more emotional and less rational. And so sometimes we don't even recognize this. Um, our, our sort of rational mind is, is so impaired that we don't even see that we are highly anxious. And so that is the first step, becoming mindful of what anxiety looks like. And since we're here, let me just spend a, a moment on the word mindful. You will hear this a lot. It's, it's, a, it's a fat, it's a, fad. I don't want to call it a fad because there's, there's, there's real merit to it, but it's something that's very popular and, you, and you'll see mindfulness training all over the place now. And, you know, first of all, what does it mean? Let, let's just do that. So I, I have, I just happen to have this uh, espresso here to demonstrate, <laughs> but you could take anything that, um, 
that you would normally drink. In fact, something that you would normally drink um, would be best, okay? And all I want you to do first is just take a drink out of it, okay? And, and drink as you normally would, have the experience you would normally ha have, okay? Now, let's drink mindfully. So what I mean by that, mindfulness is, is a, a state of hyper attention to sensation. That's really what it means to experience. So when I drink this coffee, it causes all these taste experiences in my mouth. Um, a lot of bitterness comes up because coffee has a sort of bitter flavor, but a lot of other tastes too that give a good coffee, you know, that flavor you really like. It's like the edge of bitterness, but then smooth, whatever. And so by being mindful, what we mean is sort of shut down the rest of the world for a moment and focus all your attention on taste, on what this tastes like. So let's do it again. Let's take a drink, but let's take a moment to really feel what that drink feels like, what, what, what that taste is. You know, really focus on the taste. You ready? Let's do it. One of the things you might notice with something like coffee is the taste actually lingers a lot longer than we usually notice. I still taste it. It's still in my mouth, that flavor. Okay, so you get the idea, right? So you can become mindful of anything. And in fact, almost, I, I call this the first step, but I almost think the, the first step before the first step <laughs> uh, is to play with mindfulness. Uh, those things you enjoy doing, those things that give you some form of, of pleasure or relaxation or whatever, um, Work, play with mindfulness. Try to try to ex experience them even at a deeper level. Try to focus your attention and you know really really embrace that that sort of positive feeling and do this with all the good things in your life. Um, and and it will make those good things more amplified uh, and that will make your life better already. Okay, by becoming mindful of the positive aspects of your life. Excellent. Um, now. When I'm talking about the first step here, though, though, for anxiety control, I'm going to talk about being mindful of what anxiety feels like. We have to learn that feeling in order to recognize it. Let me give you one more analogy. Um, this is kind of a funny one, but it's, a, it's an actually very accurate one. I don't know how well you guys can remember whether you wet your bed when you grew up or not. Um, most children do, right? They go through a period where they uh, have, to, have to be toilet trained. And so toilet training sort of means, you know, learning while you're, while you're awake that you have to go use the washroom and going and use the washroom. But then many children have trouble when they sleep at night. Um, not wetting the bed. And if you think about what that challenge is, the challenge to the child is, is feeling their body, sensing that feeling in their body that tells them that they have to go pee, right? We all have that feeling. We can all get pretty good at sensing that when we're awake and recognizing it. But the challenge to the child asleep is sensing that feeling when they're asleep. If they can sense that feeling, oh, I have to go to the washroom, that's the critical first step. And then of course they must get up and go to the washroom. If they do those two steps, then everything's great. So it's the same kind of thing here. I'm gonna teach you how to kind of deal with anxiety, but only if you recognize it. So you first have to recognize the feeling of anxiety building. Okay, so what does anxiety feel like? I'm gonna kind of talk about this from two, two sides. So first of all, I'm going to give you the more subjective notion. If you were somebody um, suffering from anxiety, uh, what, what would it feel like to you? Uh, and so these are the cl critical um, things people talk about. And, and this all should make sense to you now with your sympathetic nervous system knowledge. So you'll feel nervous, restless, tense, you know, a little bit uh, energized. Why? Because you have oxygen rich uh, blood pumping to your muscles. And that's giving you that strength, right? That, yeah. But it's also making you feel like you have to do something. Uh, feelings of danger, panic, or dread. So it's not just that you feel like a superhero and you feel mighty. Da, 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 I'm going to go solve some crime, something. No, it's, it's that you feel that thing and you feel a sort of danger, a foreboding. 
Uh, and that's really what makes it anxiety, right? Uh, rapid heart rate, we just talked about that sympathetic nervous system, rapid breathing, same thing. Uh, increased or heavy sweating. I didn't stress this with the sympathetic nervous system, but this is often a typical um, symptom as well. And it's because if you're going to fight or flee, um, then a challenge to the body is to keep it cool while it's undergoing exertion. Uh, and so sweating is the way that we keep our body cool. And so we have more sweating, uh, maybe trembling or muscle twitching again, because of all that oxygen rich blood. Um, now this kind of, these next two are more related to when it's a prolonged, uh, stress, the chronic kind of stress that we start to feel weakness and lethargy just because we can't be up like this all the time. And when we're up like that too long, we start to get a bit of exhaustion of the whole feeling. Uh, we also have difficulty focusing and clearly thinking about anything other than you're worried about. Remember, less blood flow to the frontal lobes, right? That's where we focus and strategize. We don't have so much of that. Um, insomnia, because we're ready for action, not sleep, right? Um, and so, and, and insomnia itself, if you start now having poor night sleep, that can compound everything. Uh, that can make any mental health issue worse, insomnia can. Uh, and so that's always something to think about. Uh, digestive problems. Why would you have digestive problems? Well, because you're not in the parasympathetic mode where digestion happens. So if you continue to eat food, but you're anxious all the time, you're not taking the time to digest that food. And that's going to lead to gas, constipation, diarrhea, all sorts of uh, gastro, gastrointestinal problems. Um, yeah, and so it, it kind of goes on and on, but let's just kind of focus on those. And you, and you get the idea. This is what anxiety feels like to the person experiencing it. Now, here again is the trick. Mm, I'll be mindful of the espresso when I drink it in front of you now. Um, uh, here's the thing. You can have all these feelings, just like that kid laying in bed that should be getting up to, to go to the washroom, but you can be kind of uh, oblivious to them. You can you not know that you're having it. Uh, and so I also like to um, highlight these things too. And these are uh, more behavioral signs of stress. Uh, and, and notice I say in you and others, I'm going to come back to this, but one of the things I'm going to suggest, if you're trying to learn when you're anxious, it's really good to have somebody else you're learning this with. And sometimes it's more effective to have them tell you when you're anxious and vice versa than to try to recognize it in yourself, at least initially, because we tend to be so blind to it. We're in that emotional mindset. We're not thinking rationally and somebody else can see it in us and say, hey, hey, I think your anxiety is a little high. And at that point, our natural reaction is going to be to say, no, it's not. Because why? Fight or flee, right? We're ready to fight anything. <laughs> Try to inhibit that and say, am I anxious? And think about these things. You know, do, do I feel these things right now? Um, that's what I would like you to, to kind of get good at. So avoiding that, you know, um, uh, reactive side, kind of defensive reaction, uh, and instead using that other person. If they say you, you're acting anxious, use that as a check time to check in on yourself. Uh, by the way, you can also do things like set notifications on your phone, just random notifications throughout the day. It beeps, and when it beeps, you say, am I anxious right now? And you can sort of check in on yourself uh, in that way to get good at detecting. But here are the, as these other things. Okay, a tendency to sweat more, that's something we can notice in ourselves or others, right? Um, or a nervous twitch or something like that. Smoking or drinking more than normal. These are sort of ways to, you know, sometimes we have this way of what we call self-medication, self-medicating. When we don't feel right, we start taking chemical substances um, in hopes that they will change our internal state. It's not really a conscious thing we do, um, but it is something people often do. And so in cases like this, they may smoke more, they may drink more. Smoking could make it worse, by the way, because um, nicotine can also kind of gear you up a little bit. Um, drinking, un unfortunately, can be helpful uh, to some people. You know, it, it can literally calm things a little bit, um, and, and therefore people may drink a lot when they're anxious uh, as a form of sort of self-medication. Not the best approach. I'll tell you a better approach. Uh, eating too many unhealthy foods or having no appetite. Uh, the no appetite reflects the fact that your digestive system is not doing a whole lot, and so it's not looking for food. Uh, the unhealthy foods or eating too many Sometimes this is a way people try to 
well, to stimulate, they don't think of it this way, of course, but the parasympathetic nervous system by eating food, you know, would that kick in the digestive process and, and put me back into that side of things? It doesn't work very well. A more direct approach is, is preferable. I'll tell you about that. But these are things you can see in somebody else, right? They're smoking more, they're drinking more, they're eating unhealthy foods like they never did, or they're not eating much. They're sweating. So those sorts of things can tell you uh, they're experiencing, um, th those are sort of physical signs. Here are some emotional signs. Are they losing their temper more quickly, fight or flee, right? Uh, are they constantly worrying about things? When our frontal lobes are shut down, um, our, our thought processes tend to get very almost rhythmic. You know, think of, think of an animal in a zoo pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth. That's sort of what our primitive brain does uh, when it's active. And so we kind of start doing a lot of that in our mind and just going through the same worry over and over again. Uh, have they lost their sense of uh, humor and or are they suffering from uncharacteristically low self-esteem? The last one's especially worrisome because it starts to hint at depression a little bit. Um, but the lack of sense of humor, humor is something we use when we're feeling good and relaxed. And if we're not feeling good and relaxed, we don't tend to find a lot of humor in things. Okay, so what I'm going to suggest to you here for this first step, we're still on Yoda's first step here, is some sort of buddy system. Um, if, if you want to do what I'm going to suggest, find somebody else to do this with, to go through this process with, and look for anxiety in each other. Also use those notifications to look for it in yourself, but look for it in each other. Agree with each other ahead of time that if one of you says, hey, you're feeling, you're looking anxious, that you won't bite their head off. You will take a moment and check in on yourself. Say, am I anxious? Are they right? Um, and if you do this with each other, eventually you can become mindful of your body. So you're, you're able to kind of sense those sensations in your body just like the coffee. Sense what that anxiety feels like. And then what? Well, then you know you're anxious, okay? That's a critical first step. The second step means controlling that. It's trying to push that anxiety back. Now, how do you do that? Well, you have to learn how to relax, but you have to learn how to relax. You do not really know how to command relaxation right now. You, you do relax every now and then, but you just kind of let it happen naturally or not. I want you to be able to summon it much more intentionally um, to push relaxation over your whole body. Why? What are we talking about here? Well, let's go back to the, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And let me tell you a funny little thing about riding motorcycles because I think it's relevant. Of course, when you start riding a motorcycle, there's things you constantly worry about, like driving off the side of the road, driving into oncoming traffic, hitting that pole that's sitting right there. Uh, and one of the things they teach you early on is that your, your eyes lead the motorcycle. So wherever you're looking, what you're, whatever you're focusing on, that is where the motorcycle will tend to go. So if you see a pole on the side of the road and you start thinking, I don't want to hit that pole, I don't want to hit that pole. And if you're looking at that pole, you're just going to go right into that pole. The thing you're trying not to do, you will do. If you don't want to hit that pole, you have to look down the middle of the road to the direction you want the bike to go. Uh, and if you focus on where you want it to go, then you'll go right by that pole and won't even you know, pay attention to it. Okay, so... Where do you want to go if you're feeling anxious? You can't focus on the anxiety. You can't say, oh my goodness, I'm so anxious. I wish I wasn't so anxious. Look, I'm sweating. I don't want to be sweating and I feel all this. And I hate feeling this and I wish I wasn't anxious. You know, if you're focusing on the anxiety, you're going to make yourself more anxious. You have to focus on the opposite of anxiety, which is relaxation. If you can instead, if you can say, oh, I'm feeling anxious. Okay, let me relax. Let me focus on how do I relax? Let me push relax. I'm going to teach you how to do this. Um, that's the critical step. You feel your anxiety go up and you start to say, okay, if you can stimulate relaxation, if you can bring, put your body into this parasympathetic mode, then that by in a sort of automatic way takes you out of that mode. Remember, this is like the opposite of that, right? So if you push this, then all of this goes away. That's the way to get rid of anxiety, is to summon relaxation. 
we have our little light switch, which is, you know, it was the amygdala that triggered this, but now I want it to be your conscious mind that triggers this. I want you to use your, your mind, which is a little tricky when you're anxious, right? Because your frontal lobes aren't getting all the blood, but you have to say, you didn't know, I know how to do this. So this is why this has to become a skill. And skills only become skills with a lot of practice. So this won't be the last time I say that in this lecture. Um, but, but here are the points that I kind of highlighted. If you focus on your stress or anxiety, you strengthen it. The right approach to banish stress is to summon the opposite state, relaxation. How do you do that? All right, Yoda. <laughs> In order to summon the feel feelings of relaxation, you first have to become intimately familiar with those feelings. More mindfulness. <laughs> it's a good thing I got a good coffee here. So, I like to sometimes describe it this way. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna mix my geeky sci-fi metaphors. But in Star Trek, they have a, a um, device, I guess you'd call it the transporter. Uh, and that transporter, a person can stand in there and they hit some buttons and they can transport you anywhere. They can put you on another planet. They can put you into another ship. They can do whatever. And so you can physically move a great distance through this transporter. Um, we can kind of do that in our mind. We can transport our body from an anxious state to a relaxed state. We can, we can transport to relaxation. Here's the trick though. Our mental transporter it can only take us to places we know very well. We have to become, as I say here, intimately familiar with that place we want to go. And so in this case, it's relaxation. If we really understand what our body feels like when it's relaxed, if we really get familiar with it, then we can summon that feeling. How do you do that? Okay. Underneath this lecture, you will see a link I have to an audio file for guided relaxation. It's one that I created. It's very simple. It's just basically me talking to my phone. You can go online and find other guided relaxation inductions um, that should do roughly the same thing and probably have higher production values and whatnot. But this is the idea. And, and I'll give you a taste of how mine works. Just, just, just to demystify, uh, I'll just say something like lay down, relax, get as comfortable as you can possibly get. Um, and then listen to my words and do the things I say. And I will start at your feet. And the first thing I'll say is like, clench your feet like they were fists. You know, these are your real feet, but clench it like it was a fist. Clench each of them as hard as you can clench them. You should feel your muscles hurting if you're clenching hard enough. And when you're doing that, keep clenching. Make them really hurt. Clench, 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 clench. Feel that pain. Feel how much, feel the tension. Feel how it all feels, you know, a little bit of mindfulness there. And then, here's the critical mindfulness, relax. Let go of your feet. And pick a word, by the way. I'm going to use the word beach. It's my favorite. So repeat that word to yourself, beach, beach. While you feel what it feels like to release the tension and the anxiety and feel the relaxation that comes into your feet. So feel the tension go, beach, beach, beach. Feel the relaxation come and over your feet, beach, beach, beach. Cool. Now we move up to your calves, calf muscles, and we do the same thing. Clench those calf muscles really, really tight, etc., etc. So I just continue right up your body, right from your feet, you know, right to the top of your of your head, clenching muscle groups and then relaxing them. But critically, feeling that relaxation, feeling what your body feels like when when you let go of the tension, when you let go of that anxiety. Um, and as you work through the whole body, you'll feel very, very relaxed. Okay, at the end of this, you'll feel almost like you've had some sort of massage, even though it's just been your mind um, all the way through. The, again, the trick is to become familiar with that feeling, to really get to know it. That's what a fully relaxed body feels like. Uh, and to connect that with a word like beach. Um, and as you do this over and over, and this is where you know I really want to stress, so here's what I would suggest to you. If you can, as many nights a week as you can, do this just before you go to bed. It puts you into a great position for, for sleeping, okay? You are relaxed, it pushes the anxiety out, so you're ready to go to sleep. Remember how critical I said sleep was to mental health. 
if you get a good night's sleep, you're already ahead of the game there. Um, but as you do it, remember to be mindful. This isn't just about getting yourself relaxed so, so you can go to sleep. It's about you learning what relaxation feels like. Don't ever forget this first step. The idea here is to become intimately familiar with what relaxation feels like. As you do this over and over, you can eventually probably stop listening to me or whoever and just do it yourself. You can guide yourself through this process. And if you do it enough, you will eventually get to the point where you don't need to go through the whole process, where you can just say, beach, 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 and push that feeling over your whole body, just like it was at the end of the guided relaxation. You can get there really quickly, okay? That you can summon relaxation over your entire uh, body through an act of will. Jedi mind trick. Cool. Um, and then you're set, right? Because you have the two critical components. You detect the anxiety as it rises, and then you summon relaxation to push it back. And you can get it to a point now where you can deal with it, a point that works for you on that anxiety relaxation sort of um continuum. Usually, for most of us, that means we want to get really relaxed. <laughs> we want to push that anxiety right in. Okay? So here's what I would like you guys to do. Um, try that guided relaxation auto, audio, uh, audio file. Again, maybe with your family or some other buddy or something like this. If you're learning the skill at two Jedis at a time, fantastic. That's great. Uh, I do suggest you can set random notifications. Uh, and you can use these to, you know, beep. Oh, am I anxious right now? Oh, I am anxious. Let me try to relax. So you can have practice all through the day of doing this notice, relax step. Um, yeah, and, and try to make this a habit. If this becomes a habit, when I talk about this with some students, I sometimes call this the psychology of being cool because that's really what's going on here. You are learning how to um, not respond emotionally which is what you do when the anxiety response kicks in. So if you're in some situation where other people are like freaking out, you're going to be able to say, okay, hang on. I'm going to summon relaxation. That's going to give me my blood to my frontal lobes. And I'm going to be the rational one. Uh, and the rational one is the cool one. So you want to be cool? I just told you how. <laughs> it's a skill though. You got to work at it. All right. <laughs> Cheers. All right, with that said, there is your, uh, there is your Jedi mind trick lesson over with. Um, I, hope, I hope you will see, or do see, how this is now an application of what you've been learning in the course. So, so you know, some people learn all about the nervous system and how it works and learn about the separation of parasympathetic and sympathetic. All of that information has value. Uh, but sometimes it, it requires somebody who, who understands that to bring this into the world of the people who might not understand it uh, and, and, and to try to give them value in that way. You know, that was my intention when I created that course at the beginning of COVID. Uh, and that's my intention here. And I, I think you see, you know, how important that role is. And, and maybe that's something you want to do uh, at some point. Cool. See you on the next one. We're going to start talking core ACs.